Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar on Ukraine. I'm Chris Sable, Executive Director of the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Dale Mosier, our board chair, and the entire Vail Symposium board, welcome. The Vail Symposium has been offering affordable, thought-provoking programming to the Vail community since 1971. Two items to be aware of before we get started. Please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. You can type those in at any time, and we'll get to them later in the program. We'll do our best to get to as many as time permits. Tonight's program will run until 7 p.m. It is being recorded, and the video will be available at veilsymposium.org. I'd like to thank the organizations and individuals who've helped make tonight's program possible. Our presenting sponsors are the Town of Vail and the Frechette Family Foundation. Our event sponsors are the Vail Daily, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, and the Antlers at Vail. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank. Cindy Ingalls has underwritten the summer season, and tonight's program is underwritten by Ken and Nina Weiss and Christine Moore. Donors at every level make our programming possible. Thank you. Our next program, Overworked and Under Threat, Preserving the Colorado River, takes place October 20th at Colorado Mountain College in Edwards from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Join the Vail Symposium and the Eagle River Watershed Council as our moderator, journalist Luke Runyon, guides us through a conversation on the Colorado River with a panel of water management experts. And we close out our summer fall season with a speaking locally program in collaboration with the Vail Valley Partnership. Join Vail Health CEO, Will Cook, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Beaver Creek Resort, Nadia Guerrero, Eagle County Manager, Jeff Schroll, and Eagle County School Superintendent, Phil Qualman, for a discussion on the state of our valley. Chris Romer, President and CEO of the Vail Valley Partnership will moderate. The program takes place on November 9th from 8.30 to 10 a.m at Colorado Mountain College in Edwards. And tonight we turn our attention to Ukraine. It's been in the, use, it's been in the news 24 seven. and We wanted to develop a program that rose to a higher level of background and discussion than you are seeing on the daily news. This program is focused on the future of democracy in Ukraine with a moderator and panel of experts who are well connected to the current situation as well as the past. How we got where we are and what we might expect for the future. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Sam Green, Director for Democratic Resilience at the Center for European Policy Analysis, SIPA. Sam is also a professor of Russian politics at King's College London. Before joining SIPA, he founded and directed the King's Russia Institute. Sam has lived in Russia for 13 years, written numerous books and scholarly policy papers on Putin, politics, and democracy. An American and British citizen, Sam holds a PhD and MSc from London School of Economics and a BSJ from Northwestern University. And he's an elected fellow of the British Academy of Social Sciences. As a reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and Sam will let me know when the panel is ready for audience questions. And now I turn it over to Sam to introduce our panelists and lead the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks to everyone for, for being here. Uh, as Chris just described very, very um, flatteringly with my background, I'm exactly the wrong tourist person to talk about uh, to talk about Ukraine uh, as, a, as a Russianist, but we do have the right people in, in the room, uh, and I'll introduce them uh, in a moment. You know, there, there was a time, I think, when, when a discussion about Ukraine probably needed to begin with a long introduction. Uh, we needed to remind people where Ukraine, Ukraine was, how long it, it, it had been there, and, and why we should care. It seems to me, for, for reasons that, that Chris has, has outlined, that that time has passed. Ukraine is at the very core of, of pretty much every co consequential conversation we're having or should be having right now. When the Federal Reserve or the ECB meet to tackle inflation, Ukraine is, is implicitly on the agenda, if not explicitly. When voters go to the polls, whether in Italy a few weeks ago or in the United States on the 8th of November, Ukraine is inherently on the ballot. It's important to remember that in, in mobilizing to support Ukraine, we're fighting, of course, in a much bigger conflict, one that will determine whether we can focus on the human challenges of development and climate and prosperity, or whether we will live in a world of territorial warfare and nuclear proliferation in which no progress is possible. 
But it's also important to remember that this was Ukraine's war before it was ours, and it remains Ukraine's war in ways that we hopefully will never have to experience. And that's why we're here today to talk about the future of a country taking on a nuclear superpower in the name of sovereignty, of dignity, and of democracy. We couldn't have a better panel, I think, uh, to, to delve into this. Uh, Luca Nakmatwe is professor of political science and co-director of the Petro Yatsik program at, uh, for the study of Ukraine in the, the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Having lived in research in Kiev and, and Donetsk, Lukin is, is one of the, the most important exceptions, I think, to the truism that Western scholars have understudied Ukraine. Uh, but Lukin has done more than just teach us about Ukraine. He's used his research on and in Ukraine to teach us about politics and the world more broadly, publishing groundbreaking books such as Pluralism by Default, Weak Autocrats and the Rise of Competitive Politics, the seminal book on competitive authoritarianism, which co-authored with, with Stephen Levitsky, and the just published magnum opus really with the same co-author, Revolution and Dictatorship. All of those should be on your shelf if you don't already have them. Uh, Sergei uh, Kudelia is, is Associate Professor of, of Political Science at Baylor University and a graduate of Ivan Franco National University in Lviv, Ukraine, and consistently one of the most sober and sobering voices on Ukrainian politics. So his research is situated at the intersection of three questions that are of vital importance to our understanding of what's going on right now. How insurgencies and civil wars erupt and are fought, how political systems and regimes come and go, and how the design of political institutions shapes both democratic and authoritarian political practice. So he also has the distinction of being one of a relatively few serious scholars to predict Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine earlier this year. His forthcoming book on the start of the war in 2014, based on extensive field work in Eastern Ukraine, looks deeper into the dynamics of Ukrainian society than most commentators can or really would dare to. So he, Lukin, welcome. Uh, Lukin, if I, if I may, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, I'm not sure we've ever seen a rally around the flag as phenomenal as what we're seeing uh, in Ukraine, what Ukrainians have shown us in the last eight months. But it's it also strikes me as more than that. Ukrainians have rallied around one another in really powerful ways and around political institutions that have often struggled to win the support and trust of ordinary citizens. Uh, how would you characterize the impact that this war has had and is continuing to have on, on Ukrainian democracy? Well, th thanks for the question. I mean, I just want to first start off by saying that you know, Ukraine, uh, before the uh, the second invasion or the, what they call the full scale invasion, because uh, Ukraine was initially invaded by Russia, of course, in 2014, has been uh, easily the most democratic country in in the post Soviet space. Um, it has had, you know, five different presidents uh, and you know many many democratic turnovers. Um, at the same time, I, what's you know Ukrainian politics before 2014 was very much characterized as, a, and I think partly correctly as a divided society and sort of discussions of Ukraine, including my own, overwhelmingly focused on East versus West Ukraine, who, you know, uh, who, you know, each part of the country supported different political parties, all of which is worth emphasizing supported Ukrainian independence, but they had different visions of Ukrainian foreign policy, one more oriented towards the East and one more oriented towards the West. Um, with I think what really started uh, the, the shift in Ukraine was, first of all, the election of um, Volodymyr Zelensky, who's from a Russophone, you know, native Russian speaker um, from, uh, from central Ukraine, who's very much immersed in Russian culture. And, um, and his election really began sort of dissolving that, that divide between East and West. And you saw a sort of increase in support for Euro-Atlantic structures already beginning in 2019. And then having him as president, of, you know, in many ways, culturally Russian president uh, as the head of Ukraine during the invasion, I think has essentially ended discussion of regional divisions in Ukraine, at least for now. You don't hear any of that now. It's really sort of a united Ukraine, which is quite stunning for those of us who studied Ukraine for so long. And so I think that's really um, the, the biggest short-term impact is that Putin and together with Zelensky have really united, united Ukraine. 
Thank you. Actually, I want to uh, pick up on that um, and, and turn to, to Serhi. Uh, before the war, as, as Lukin was saying, right, a lot of the conversation about Ukraine was about division, right? Uh, and that's, you know, to a certain extent, you know, it extends to today. We, we can look at, at Elon Musk's recent, recent comments. Um, uh, but there had been a sense, I think, that people sometimes would, would exaggerate that, right? Um, since 2014, certainly since February of of this year, right? It's been common to talk about the ways in which Putin and the wars have helped Ukrainian bridge the dividing lines of, of language, geography, religion, ideology, um, and an and outlook that, that Lukin was talking about. Um, is, it, is it fair to say that, that the war has forged a, a new unity in which you know, there are no longer constituencies for Putin to exploit, or are we in danger of exaggerating that too? Yes, well, that process uh, really began in 2014, and this has been very well documented in a number of studies and surveys that have been done, particularly in southern eastern Ukraine, uh, where we've seen uh, the rise in civic identity and civic attachment. Uh, we also seen the rise in the sense of patriotism and willingness to die for the country. Um, and right before the war, I think in January of this year, there have been uh, a number of polls done with the specific question, uh, what would be your response if Russia attacks Ukraine? And prior to 2014, when these questions were posed, many Ukrainians were saying, the majority of Ukrainians in these regions were saying that we probably would not do anything. But uh, this year in January, the majority opinion was that we will try to contribute to resistance, either directly by participating in the combat operations or in the form of volunteering uh, and helping or assisting the war effort. And I think that is uh, a clear indication of the path or transition that the Ukrainian society took in the last eight years. But at the same time, I want to say and address something that Lukan just said about um, the so-called um, impact that Zelensky might have had on the Ukrainian society. Uh, I uh, endorsed Zelensky when he was running for president. I supported him as a politician in 2019. Um, for various reasons, not necessarily for cultural reasons. But I have to say that since 2019, and that has also been documented in the polls, many of his voters in Eastern and Southern parts of Ukraine actually turned against him primarily because he failed to deliver on some of the key promises regarding both uh, the search for uh, some kind of a compromise or um, peace agreement settlement of the conflict in Donbas with Russia but also because he initially promised to reverse many of the ethnocentric cultural policies that have been adopted under his predecessor, Petro Poroshenko, and he never did. And in fact, he reinforced many of these policies regarding the exclusive Ukrainian language use in the public sphere and regarding the education that had to be primarily limited to Ukrainian. Uh, Russians could send their kids to school, but only study in Russian up until the grade four. So many of these policies were not reversed. And so that was the result. Uh, the, uh, as a result, we've seen a rise in support for some of the pro-Russian political forces. Um, a number of new pro-Russian political projects emerged. Uh, and there has been a, a, a strong anti-Zelensky campaign on many of the media channels that were owned by the oligarchs that were close or, or sympathetic to Russia or were representatives of the East. And so for this reason, right before the war, many analysts questioned whether Zelensky actually could be reelected if he decides to run again. His popularity was still the most popular politician in the country, but his popularity was around 25% at that time. And so this new phenomenon of Zelensky being suddenly uh, a choice of the absolute majority of Ukrainians the rally around the flag effect, so-called, is really the result of his performance as a leader uh, since the aggression began. Um, and the fact that uh, he is our only hope as far as leading the country out of this war. Thank you. I wanna uh, actually put this um, question to, to, to both of you, um, following on really from, from what you just said, Serhi. Zelensky has been a phenomenally successful wartime president, right? He's consolidated both society and, and the state, right? A state that, you know, again, the dominant sort of conversation about Ukraine was about a state that didn't seem to function very well. And, and, and yet it's, it's held together and function actually quite well throughout, 
throughout this war. In the process, though, he's taken on quite a lot of power, right? Uh, both formally and, uh, and and informally, right? That that simply by virtue of being who he is when when he is. But there's also been the necessity of, of centralizing and concentrating power as part as as a wartime president. Um, when the war is over, right, uh, and ordinary politics returns, what does that what does that look like? Do you expect the the, the push and pull to to return? Would we expect Zelensky to to relinquish power? Okay, so uh, this is a big question. Uh, let me just say, for the sake of brevity, I know Wolfgang has a view on that as well. For the sake of brevity, let me just say that I think the basis for the Ukrainian democratic competitive political process up until 2000 and uh, basically 22 up until this year uh, um, was on, rested on three uh, major factors. One factor, of course, something that Luke already mentioned is the regional diversity within Ukraine. The second important factor uh, was the fact that you had alternative sources of wealth that political candidates can turn to. And so you have a diversity of oligarchs that supported different points in time, different political projects. And the third important source was civil society. So you had consistently a very strong media establishment, lots of independent journalists, and you had civic watchdogs who were uncovering corruption cases and so on. That influenced public opinion. To some degree, maybe the fourth factor that's worth mentioning is also Western backing and conditionality that I think played a role, especially in 2019 also to a degree in 2004, when there were certain concerns about Ukraine's democratic path. Now, if we look into the future, uh, and we are really uh, eight months into this, into this war, if we look into the future, what are some of the, what happens to these factors? Well, first of all, oligarchs, some of the oligarchs are destroyed. They went bankrupt. Some of them substantially weakened. Renat Akhmetov, who was an owner of a number of uh, media outlets, withdrew his, uh, gave up his business uh, and said he would stop funding any of the uh, uh, television channels or newspapers that he was funding. Uh, the remaining television channels are now consolidated fully under the state control. Um, there are no alternative uh, media platforms, uh, aside from online, of course, but in television, no alternative, alternative uh, media platforms when you, where you can hear a critical view or, or opinion uh, on the Ukrainian government. Understandable in the time of war, but certainly uh, of concern when you look into the future. You also see on the positive side, uh, the, uh, the, the um, disillusion of a number of political parties that may be viewed as authoritarian parties. Um, uh, the party of Medvedchuk, for example, has been dissolved and uh, a number of others. Uh, but at the same time, what it says is it says the precedent of basically the state being willing, being able to dissolve political parties based on the claim that they are somehow sympathetic to Russia. Whether or not this precedent can have a negative effect on democracies remains to be seen, but it certainly can have a negative effect. It can be abused by, by, by the state. Uh, we also see that the West has been excessive, almost fully uh, concentrated on issues of security. Democracy is of much lesser concern. Again, that is understandable, but that is something that uh, may have a negative effect on Ukrainian democracy in the future. We are seeing the rise of the Zelensky's personality cult and people are uh, obsessed about him as an individual in the West and uh, many in Ukraine. That may have a negative effect as well. Um, and we see a general set of restrictions on political and civic activism in Ukraine. Um, uh, some of the independent journalists, for example, are reporting being followed by the security service, etc. cetera. Um, their parliament does not act as a constraint, as a check. The government uh, is fully under Zelensky's control and his head of his office, uh, Mr. Yermak, has, does have excessive uh, powers that do not correspond to the formal powers of his office. As this process goes on, that is my concern and my worry that as this process goes on for, for months, maybe years, we may see uh, challenges for Ukrainian democracy just because many of the factors that contributed to Ukrainian uh, competitiveness and pluralism are not there, will not be there anymore. Thank you. I'm gonna come back and, and, and press you on some of that in, in a minute, but I wanna give Luke a, a chance first. 
Uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, so one thing I just want to clarify, um, the term pro-Russian, which is a little bit confusing, and I think it's important to emphasize that, I mean, I tend to kind of prefer the term Russophile because it, 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 pro-Russian does not mean that the party supported union with the Russian state. It largely meant a sort of cultural affinity with Russian culture, which is not the same thing as joining uh, the country. I mean, as you know, there's a many people in the United States are quite Anglophiles, does not mean that they want to become part of the monarchy. So I think this is a, a subtle but you know incredibly important distinction that all the parties we're talking about and the reasons we're talking about before the invasion overwhelmingly supported Ukrainian independence. So as to the question of um, Ukrainian democracy, I think you know we always uh, need to be concerned about the fate of democracy. Um, you know, Ukraine I think has been pretty close to democracy, or you know, for the last. 30 some years, but democracy is not some genetic trait. It's not like, you know, hair color or, you know, skin color. It, 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 it's not kind of permanent in, 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 a, in a country. It has to constantly be fought for. And I do, and I think that there's reasons to be uh, concerned about the future. For one, what was, what, what was distinctive about Ukraine before the 2014 invasion certainly was that nationalism, which normally forms the basis of a lot of authoritarian regimes in the world, actually divided Ukraine because, because of differences over sort of where kind of civilizational differences in terms of where citizens of Ukraine saw Ukraine either in the kind of Russian sphere of influence or the European sphere of influence. After the invasion, in a sense, Ukraine is becoming a normal country in which you know, nationalism can, I think, potentially be the basis for authoritarianism. And I think that, is, you know, that should be um, absolutely of concern. Um, and I think that, you know, um, at the same time, a couple of things are worth noting. I mean, um, you know, it is during wartime and you know, Great Britain did not have an election between 1935 and 1945. I mean, you know, and, it, you know, Great Britain wasn't even, you know, directly occupied or by an enemy state. So I think, you know, one has to sort of acknowledge that given the, the, the real existential threat um, faced by Ukraine, that the sort of limitations on democracy are real. I also think that um, you know there were real problems in the run-up to uh, the the second invasion or um, the sort of full-scale invasion in terms of restrictions on Russian language media. Now, I think what's I think the distinction you know people oftentimes criticize both the Poroshenko, who was president before uh, Zelensky, and uh, Zelensky for sort of shutting out uh, Russian media. The issue here isn't whether that's a good thing or bad thing, but the fact that the process itself was not very transparent and therefore open to political abuse. In other words, I think that everybody can understand that a country needs to preserve its security and it's absolutely um, with, you know, in the norm to restrict certain enemy media, that especially Russian media, which is clearly sought to undermine uh, Ukrainian statehood. The issue was of creating a transparent um, and process that would um, sort of limit the amounts of political abuse. Thanks. Um, I want to see if I can flip the conversation a little bit. We've, we've, we've gotten a bit, uh, a bit pessimistic and obviously there's a lot of things to, to, to worry about. Um, but, you know, as, as I said at the outset, you know, I'm somebody who spent my career studying, studying Russia right, and seeing Sort of Ukraine over the uh, over the border, reading about it, reading the work that that, that you and others have done, um, and, and 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 has always been struck as a number of, of, of us and a number of people in Russia itself right, have been over the years by um, the adherence that Ukrainian citizens have to a sense of their own political agency, right? To a sense that that this is a state that belongs to them uh, and that political leaders. Um, uh, uh, work for them, right? Uh, and we have seen them face down presidents time and again, Lucan, you mentioned that there have been democratic transfers of power, but there have also been Ukrainian presidents who have tried to avoid democratic transfers of power um, and uh, who have tried to make themselves unaccountable and they have lost um, uh, in, in, in those attempts. Um, uh, so here you, you outlined some things that do make Ukraine different right, in terms of, of sort of structural divides um, the, 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 the geographic pluralism, 
uh, the necessity of economic pluralism, right? That you can't get the entire economic elite uh, under sort of one umbrella the way that Putin has been able to in Russia, for example. Um, but it strikes me that that's not quite enough, right? To explain why Ukrainians have continually uh, stood up for democracy as a as a thing, as a as a practice. Do you have a an explanation for that, Lucan? Maybe start with you. Um. You know, I, I'm not, it's hard to say. I mean, I, you know, I, I, first of all, I, mean, I think it's worth the emphasis on emphasizing that you, uh, you know, Ukraine is a democracy, has been a democracy. Um, it's not clear to me that that is rooted in democratic values. I mean, it's certainly surveys that um, Professor Mike Bisinger at, at Princeton have done of sort of participants in the Orange Revolution of 2004 and Euromaidan show that you know a lot of the, you know a good chunk of the participants actually did not necessarily support. Um, you know, democracy. Um, I think, and so in the past, um, you know, I think that democracy has been um, rooted to an important extent in regional divisions. Um, I mean, certainly the sort of protests in 2004 and 2013 and 2014 were really regionally focused um, in, in, the, in the sense that Western Ukraine uh, was overwhelmingly dominated uh, both protests um, that sort of resisted basically efforts by uh, autocrats to sort of impose authoritarianism on Ukraine. Um, I do, however, think that sort of, you know, those regional divisions aren't necessarily gone from Ukraine, which I think is a positive thing. I mean, it's certainly, they're not, you know, salient right now in this, in the context of a foreign invasion. Um, but I think it certainly does not mean that once peace is achieved, you know, those regional um, uh, divisions, which I think are actually are very important for pluralism in, in Ukraine won't reemerge. Um, so in that sense, I, I, I find it hard to believe that sort of the regional divisions have complete, been completely mm -hmm. wiped out, but we'll see. Right. It's important, important. I mean, if you want people to compete, they have to have things to compete about and compete over. Serhi. Yes, I, I agree entirely uh, with Lucan. Uh, both in uh, 2004 and 2014, these two revolutions, which we tend to view as democratic revolutions, and they certainly were uh, framed uh, by their leaders as revolutions meant to assert democratic values within the society. In both of these revolutions, you have a, a, a multiplicity of different actors. Uh, these revolutions were driven by broad coalitions. Uh, we forget about that, but in 2004, communists were part of the opposition coalition too. Socialists were a big part of the co uh, protest coalition. And they were united by the rejection of uh, the ruling elite. They were uh, united to some extent uh, by the fact that some of them were interested in taking positions of power and benefiting from them. Uh, and that is exactly what happened, as we know, when Yushchenko came to power and he formed the new government. Um, to some extent, 2014 was a replay when, where you had the mobilization of multiple actors where nationalists played a much more visible role. They were in minority. Nobody. Uh, questions that, but they certainly played a very significant role, especially and in the end game of the revolution, and uh, to some extent influenced how exactly the circumstances in which it ended. Uh, many of the nationalist actors who participated in this revolution and fought against Yanukovych, they were not democratic at all, and they would be considered as extremist, far right, uh, anti-democratic, etc., xenophobic, and so on. So the fact that you have protests and this popular mobilization is to me uh, a reflection of the fact that for uh, at least a decade, if not longer, uh, our political competition uh, or these cleavages, political cleavages uh, emerged around broader issues, not just limited to democratic values, but also cultural values or foreign policy issues, your orientation towards the European Union versus Russia whether or not you support the use of Ukrainian language everywhere, or you want to have a society which speaks different languages. Um, and so these issues, as they became more salient, uh, they brought, in, brought out people onto the streets as well. And uh, I think what's happening right now, and this has been the trend started uh, obviously under Poroshenko, but I think it accelerated significantly under uh, uh, Zelensky, especially since the full-scale invasion of Russia, is a greater consensus within the Ukrainian society on the issues like the language use, for example. Nobody 
questions, I think, anymore that we need to have a more ethnocentric society in order to be more immune to the Russian subversive activities from within. Um, there is a mass switch in terms of language use uh, and language practices by uh, many uh, Russophile, as Lukan calls them, politicians or intellectuals who are now insisting on using the Ukrainian language for these very reasons. And so it, it is done. I mean, it is not forced. I think it's, it's a good thing about it. If uh, Sammy wants us to be positive and optimistic, it is, it is a conscious choice of people as they understand how these cultural issues can be weaponized by Russia and used against us in, uh, during the invasion. And we've seen how they've been using that on the territories that they occupied, especially in the South, when they were trying to mobilize people for the Shem referendums exactly under this uh, slogan that now you can speak Russian language and learn and uh, study Russian poets and writers in, in your native language. Thank you. Um, note to the, to the audience, I, I see a question is beginning to come in, in, into the Q&A function, so I would encourage you to, um, uh, uh, to, to write. I'm going to ask one last question before, we, uh, before I ask Chris to, to open it up to the, to the audience. Um, and it's it's to, to, to broaden the frame out a little bit um, beyond just the, the politics and, and, and think about society as well. We've um, uh, talked a lot sort of in the public space and, and marveled at, at Ukrainian resilience uh, in the face of this invasion and, and, and that, that, that resilience is real, but we probably shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that it is unlimited or, or inevitable. Right? And as we've watched in the last few days, uh, in particular, the increasing barbarity of, of Russia's attacks, attacks that will destroy lives and livelihoods without really having any impact on the, on the front line. Right? These are attacks on Ukrainian resilience. Right? Um, so, um, you know, uh, can uh, Ukrainian society hold together uh, under this? And, and how, can we, how can we help? Um, if I may, I think absolutely. I think it, you know, it has shown that it can be. At this point, I think, in some ways, um, I think the Kharkiv counteroffensive of um, of September, in which um, Ukraine regained massive amounts of territory, uh, was in some ways equivalent in the kind of psyche, global psyche, to Stalingrad in World War II, when in the you know uh, the defeat of Germany. At Stalingrad in World War II, kind of shifted the expectation about who would win the war. That German, the expectation was that Germany would lose the war. And I think, to an important extent, the Kharkiv counteroffensive has played a similar role in the sense of, you know, adjusting people's expectations and, you know, raising expectations that Ukraine can and will win the war. And I, I'm, I'm, my sense, although I have not been on the ground in Ukraine, is that that, that is very much the expectation of Ukrainians themselves. Um, and that you know that um, many note that while the initial invasion of, of February there was a sense of panic in in Kiev. Now there, you know, there's certainly horrific you know death and as you say completely unnecessary this you know deaths that serve no military purpose. But one does not get the sense of panic or kind of desire to surrender at all. So I I, I think that. Um, if anything, um, that's going to sort of this is only kind of strengthens Ukrainian resolve, um, and also um, you know hopefully sort of encourages continued Western support for the Ukrainian military. Yeah, so um, it always strikes me uh, how little Putin understands Ukraine and how flawed his understanding of the Ukrainian people is. And we just go back to two thousand and four. And you kind of wonder, why didn't he learn his lessons back then? Because already back then, it was very clear that Putin's calculations about how Ukrainian society will respond were completely off the mark. And yes, there were a number of consultants, including some people of Ukrainian origins, who advised him that it's possible to impose on the Ukrainian society his preferred choice. But when he realized that it backfired, why didn't he readjust his expectations and understand or corrected his understanding of Ukrainian society. The same thing happened in 2014, when it became clear that his idea of Novorossiya is not going to fly, 
in the southern and other parts of eastern Ukraine, and that the majority of Ukrainians do not want to see Russian flags or separatist flags anywhere around their houses or government buildings, he still did not correct his expectations. And now he keeps making, making some of these same mistakes, starting from a completely botched Kiev offensive, which resulted in, in a completely unnecessary, huge civilian victimization, um, and nothing else other than destroyed buildings, destroyed, destroyed lives of humans who live there. And now he is using the same tactic, trying to put Ukrainians on, their, on our knees, because he thinks that if he engages in this indiscriminate uh, rocket attacks all around Ukraine and destroys some of our energy uh, system, 30% uh, of uh, Ukraine was without electricity for some time, for a day or more, then people will get afraid looking into winter and would suddenly start to pressure Zelensky to surrender. But this is exactly the opposite. That's what's happening. Uh, the mayor of Lviv, uh, which, was, which suffered these attacks and lost uh, electricity and water supply on that day, on Monday when these attacks happened, he, he used this interesting Ukrainian, Polish Ukrainian word, which says, uh, Lvivianev kurvalese, uh, meaning uh, you, uh, our, the Lviv residents got really pissed off. <laughs> That's a, that's, a, that's a very uh, uh, nice translation, accurate, uh, very uh, nice translation of this word. And so in a way, uh, no, we are not going to see any desire to surrender. Uh, we actually will see greater uh, intensity of resistance on the part of the Ukrainians. Uh, yes, uh, I, I don't want to repeat all, all of these uh, uh, shares about the need for more weapons. We understand what we need and air defense systems and things like that. Uh, but the main thing we've got, the main thing Ukrainians got, and that is the desire to win. As Lukan said, there is there has been a shift in public opinion. People believed in the possibility of victory. They believed in that in spring. But I think there is an absolute consensus and confidence now that Russia has no chance of winning. Can, can I just um, to emphasize one point that uh, Sergei made, which is that it's important to remember just what kind of influence Russia has lost in Ukraine. Until 2014, it used to be that Russia had a direct line to one of the major ruling parties, essentially, in Ukraine. So every time there was a kind of Russophile uh, party in power in Kiev, you know, they had a direct line to that, right? Um, so enormous sort of informal and oftentimes uh, corrupt influence. I mean, by the way, the same goes for Germany, right? Um, with uh, Schroeder and, and the SPD. Um, but by invading Ukraine, they have completely lost that. I mean, they, they basically took what was an enormous amount of informal influence and completely eliminated that and sort of have sort of turned the society, much of which was very sort of pro-Russian or sort of sympathetic towards Putin. And obviously completely, you know, for generations, has destroyed that relationship. So it is really quite remarkable the extent to which Putin and his actions has, has destroyed Russian global influence in the region, but also obviously beyond. Indeed, uh, lots more uh, to keep talking about, but Chris, do you wanna open this up to uh, audience questions? Yes, thanks. It's been uh, fascinating so far. So this is a question from Stephen. He says, I appreciate the way that the war has changed Ukraine and somewhat united the East and West regarding the national vision. However, culturally, neither Ukraine or Russia have a tradition of democracy. In a future post-war Ukraine, do you think democracy will be embraced as the preferred form of government and be able to overcome intra-regional differences and be able to overcome the endemic corruption that existed in pre-war Ukraine and exists in Russia today? So if I can take that, and first of all, I just want to emphasize that these regional differences actually were a source of democracy, not a, sort of an impediment. Um, and, and also, you know, Ukraine has 30 years of a tradition of democracy. So it's actually quite wrong to say Ukraine does not have a tradition of democracy. It does, you know, five different democratic turnovers. Um, I think also, I just want to add that I think another sort of, um, you know, kind of, in a sense, factor that really is supporting democracy you know, would be or will be um, Ukraine's entrance into the European Union, uh, which of course is not a panacea as we see with Hungary, but certainly is going to encourage democratic trends. And also, I think, you know, 
Ukraine's dependence on Western assistance, I mean, I think, you know, um, make it sort of, in a sense, much harder, sort of at least increase obstacles to any sort of uh, leader in Ukraine who wants to kind of reverse democratic gains, because I think that's not going to be looked on favorably um, by the West. Yes, very briefly, uh, that is what I oftentimes encounter now in conversations with many Ukrainians. And that is the sense of the other, meaning Russia, is now so strong, uh, it's so consolidated, that when we think about our future, political future, we want to be different from Russia, not only in terms of the language, not in terms of the culture, but also in terms of the political system that we have, in terms of the access to civic freedoms, political, economic freedoms, and ability to uh, choose and vote for our leaders. And I think that understanding that Ukraine needs to be different from Russia in all respects, and that the war is not just the war for our independence, but also the war to preserve our freedoms. I think that is a very powerful factor that in the future will make it much harder for even a person like Zelensky, super popular individual, uh, to, um, uh, to transgress against people's rights. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a question from Bob, and he asks, since the U.S. and the West have been threatening Russia with NATO expansion for 20 years, why are we surprised that Russia finally attacked to protect their interests in Crimea, especially the military bases in Sevastopol and the Donbass? Um, NATO is a complete red herring when it comes to Ukraine. Um, for, uh, Russia had already taken NATO off the table with its invasion of 2014 um, by sort of creating internationally contested borders. There's almost you know, no chance that, that and, and Russia knew this, that Ukraine uh, would join NATO or NATO would allow Ukraine to join it because NATO is never going to join, NATO is never going to allow a country to join it if there are contested international borders because that would have immediately Put NATO onto a war foot, footing with with Russia, and if you even look at TASS, the state agency of, of, of Russia, before the war, they admitted that the sort of that the sort of chances of, of NATO membership for Ukraine was sort of off the table. So I think that is a complete red herring. I mean, one can have a dis disagreement about whether you know NATO should have done this or that, but the conflict with with uh, between Russia and Ukraine had you know really nothing to do with NATO. Sergey, do you have anything to add or should we go on? Very, very briefly, I, I think th this, uh, I agree with Lukan, of course, and I think this line of reasoning uh, is very dangerous because in a way it justifies uh, the takeover or the capture of the territory of an independent state by the fact that this very state is exercising its choice, its, its, the, its sovereign right to choose the alliance that it wants to belong to. I may not, I was not a big supporter of, of uh, NATO membership for Ukraine. I, in fact, uh, my uh, integrated thesis was about why Ukraine was supposed to be a, a neutral state. But I also uh, understand the reasons, uh, and they're very clear, of course, now, why so many Ukrainians prefer to see Ukraine in, the NA in, in NATO, a member of NATO. And ultimately, it was the consensus of people in power at that time, uh, Yushchenko, Timoshenko, uh, who, uh, which ultimately led to this application for NATO membership and to the decision of uh, at the NATO summit in Bucharest to uh, assure Ukraine that it will at some point become uh, a member of NATO. Now, that assurance was very much future looking. There was no clear date on that. And it was also a clear understanding that without a consensus within the Ukrainian society, that membership will never come to pass. Well, guess what? Up until 2014, Ukraine was divided on the issue of NATO membership. And in fact, uh, a minority or very slight majority of Ukrainians supported NATO membership. What changed that was the Russian invasion, was the annexation of Crimea. And that pushed the support to about 60%, 65%. But with the current full-scale invasion, I think the support for NATO membership is over 80%. So instead of actually preventing or interfering with uh, Ukraine's membership in NATO, Putin has been giving all the reasons for Ukraine, 
for Ukrainians and Ukraine to ask and demand NATO membership for the country. And even from, from the standpoint of cooperation, military cooperation with the West, as we now know, the extent of Ukrainian cooperation with the United States and Western countries is so significant that it basically it can be viewed as a de facto member of the military alliance without certainly the guarantees of its protection under Article 5. So I just want to quickly follow up there. I mean, NATO membership is not something that was forced on countries. It's something that countries desperately wanted precisely to avoid what happened to Ukraine in February 2022. So it boggles the mind why Russia would think that by invading Ukraine, that would discourage membership. That pre precisely you know, reminded people of why NATO was created. So of course, support for NATO is going to rise dramatically. I mean, you know, this is, I understand this is not the topic of this session, but, you know, in my view, um, you know, the invasion had much more to do with great Russian nationalism and, and the unwillingness of, of, of large sections of the Russian elite and public to accept that Ukraine was an independent country. That provides a much more direct explanation uh, for the invasion than any concern about NATO, which was irrelevant in the Ukrainian context. So it just ties back to the earlier comments you were making about Putin's miscalculations. So Rebecca asks, and this can be, I think, both about the war, but also about the future of democracy. What role does the Orthodox Church play in this scenario? I'll let Sergey take that. Yes, well, um, the question, of course, is which Orthodox Church are you talking about? Not sure. Are you talking about Moscow Patriarchate? Are you talking about the Ukrainian Church, Kiev Patriarchate? We have so many different Orthodox churches. Uh, but uh, if I understand the question correctly, yes, in 2014, Russian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarchy, um, had a significant influence on the developments on the ground. There was an ideological uh, basis for many of the militants. They created their uh, militant units uh, under the banners uh, of uh, Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, one, I think one of the militant units was called Russian Orthodox Army. Um, so they provided an ideological grounding for the war. Uh, they consistently, meaning the Russian Orthodox Church, consistently reinforced some of the narratives that were coming into the Kremlin regarding the unity of the Slavic people and Slavic nations and the natural historical attachment of the Ukrainian people to the Russian people. Um, they provided this kind of, uh, uh, I guess, a religious basis for why, uh, or sacred basis for why people in Ukraine who go to the church, to Russian Orthodox Church, or Ukrainian Orthodox Church that belongs to Moscow Patriarchate, have to embrace Kremlin's narratives, right? So yes, it was an important factor uh, as far as helping Putin uh, advance his um, ideological narratives and mobilizing people, Russians, into the war. And it also provided um, a cover for some of the militants to transfer arms, for example. When I visited uh, the city of Slavetsk, I talked to a number of Orthodox priests, and they said that during the services in 2014, uh, Orthodox priests from Moscow, of Moscow Patriarchate, uh, were openly advocating in favor of separatists and were encouraging people to support separatists and uh, provide them with all kinds of assistance. Now, um, of course, under Poroshenko, uh, one of the changes that happened was an attempt to unify Ukrainian Orthodox community that has been traditionally very divided. And to an extent, he succeeded in that. And this was certainly one of his major achievements and one of his major legacies. And the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kiev Patriarchate is now recognized by Constantinople. So there was a traditional problem, a historical problem that Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kiev Patriarchate has not been recognized uh, as an independent church, uh, but now it is. Uh, and so we have two major churches, uh, three major churches, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church with the Central Lviv, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kiev Patriarchate, and there is still uh, a Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate, which has been increasingly, by the way, uh, critical for uh, um, uh, they were certainly critical of Russia's policies, but they were also trying to distance themselves from the position of Patriarch Kirill. 
I'm not an expert on church politics, so it, it's hard for me to say exactly what is going on. But from my understanding and my perception is that they're increasingly opting for a more autonomous stance and more autonomous institutional uh, position uh, with vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, vis -vis Moscow. Thank you. Uh, Joyce wants to know if you can speak on the future of Crimea as far as it rejoining Ukraine when and however this <laughs> turns out. Um, I think um, until very recently, that would have been considered um, uh, sort of a sort of a, a, you know, almost, you know, off the table in terms of unlikely scenario. I think that sort of much of the international environment after 2014 had more or less accepted informally, at least that Crimea would remain part of Russia. I think uh, with the sort of quote unquote annexations, um, you know, that have recently taken place under Putin, as well as the um, as well as the military victory, suddenly um, the fate of Crimea is much more open to question than it was before February 2022. So it's another example of a case in which basically Putin has snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. <laughs> you know, he had all these advantages. He more or less kind of had de facto acceptance, at least if not formal, of uh, possession of Crimea. I think that's much more open to question right now, especially if you see, um, you know, Ukrainian victories over in Kherson and, and, and Zaporizhia. You know, I think if, if certainly if Ukraine feels like it has the military capacity to retake uh, Crimea, uh, they, they will certainly take it. But I don't know if Serhii, I'm sure you have other things to add on this. Well, let me add something. I, I fully agree again with Lucan uh, about uh, this change in the expectations with regard to where Crimea will belong. Uh, and uh, certainly after the full-scale invasion, that becomes increasingly a serious option for Ukraine to consider. But we also have seen a, ch a change in tactics. So since 2014, Ukraine, Ukraine intentionally avoided direct attacks on the Crimean Peninsula. Um, they were, uh, even though they were protesting and opposing the Crimean annexation, they did not recognize it, but there were no attempts to engage in any military attacks on the peninsula. Now that has changed and we've seen what happened, uh, not just with the Crimean bridge, but also uh, with uh, uh, different types of attacks in other parts of Crimea um, that uh, apparently Ukrainians are responsible for. Uh, and there is an explicit promise now on the part of Zelensky to continue the war uh, and to keep on fighting until all of the territories, including Crimea, are liberated. Uh, and so since this is, the genie is now out of the bottle, we are now pledging to do it through violent means. Because remember, prior to 2022, we tried to talk, play diplomatic games, and we're saying we can do it through nonviolent means somehow. Now we're not playing these games anymore. We're just directly saying we will keep attacking the Russian side everywhere it controls or occupies Ukrainian territory. And so that means that the war with Russia, Russian-Ukrainian war, can only end after Crimea is liberated. Thanks. Uh, here's a question from Merv, and he wants to know why Zelensky has not been assassinated by Russia. Soft topic from the democracy theme here, but anybody want to weigh in on that? I think it's a great question. I don't know why from the beginning there wasn't some kind of missile that went after the presidential administration. Um, I think certainly the war might have turned out quite differently if uh, Zelensky had been assassinated. I think that you know, certainly there have been attempts, but um, they have clearly been thwarted. And I think um, you know that. Uh, well, we don't know exactly why. I mean, I don't know, Serhii. Why do you? Why do you think? Um, because Zelensky is invincible. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> the possible explanations. Uh, I guess uh, uh, Russians, uh, or rather, rather Putin, wants to uh, keep some of his uh, strongest car cards, I guess, uh, in, in the stack and not play them at the beginning, at, uh, from the start. Um, he likes blackmail. He may be blackmailing uh, Zelensky, may blackmailing Ukrainian leadership. 
and we've seen that he continues to do that with his re uh, recent rocket attacks. But there have been consistent falls on the part of uh, various Russian propaganda um, uh, propagandists uh, that um, Russia needs to target Zelensky. So that option is openly, publicly discussed on Russian television. That you need to be aware of that. Um, and 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 so I, I certainly wouldn't take it off the table as a possibility for the future. If I can come in on that, I think I think that's right. It's not off the table, but I think that, that Putin also is in a bit of a bind. You know, among his own preferences, right? I think that he certainly wants to win this war uh, if he can, uh, although he may be less convinced as possible than, than, than he was um, seven or eight months ago. But um, he also, uh, I think, is not very happy with the idea of, of, of killing presidents in general. Uh, it's one of the things that actually really um, soured, uh, uh, you know, once and for all his relationship with the West, particularly was the, the death of Gaddafi. Um, and um, and, and he has this image in his mind and one that he tries to project to the world of, of, of you know, people being in power, of, of being inherently legitimate and they shouldn't be touched. Um, so while he would probably be very happy eventually to see you know, Zelensky out of power and, and maybe even in, in prison, I think that he may worry about the optics of, of, of what would happen if, um, uh, if he were to be killed. But that gets about as close to Putin sort of psychology as I'm willing to, as I'm willing to go. But uh, Sam, forgive me, were there attempts against Saakashvili? I thought there were attempts, assassination attempts against Saakashvili. At least what um, he, that's what he claimed. Yes, and there was an attack on Yushchenko, right? Um, but um, uh, yes. So it's wait, are you saying that there weren't attempts on uh, Zelensky, Sam? I don't know. Right. No. Um, but I think that if there were, I think that he would want it to look like there was some kind of plausible deniability. He might want it to look like it was something that was done by, you know, Ukrainians um, in in opposition, right, rather than uh, rather than, than being decapitated by the by the Russian military itself. Um, and he's he's tried to play this very awkward game of 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 plausible deniability in 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 Ukraine for a very long time. Right, it obviously becomes a lot harder with this. Uh, uh, with this war, right? Uh, but if you look at some of the ways in which the war has been prosecuted, that does keep keep coming up. But we're getting off off topic. Sorry to to, to re hijack the conversation, Chris. No, thank you for for joining us. Linda asks, "What is the Wagner Group?" That's more Sam's. <laughs> uh, the Wagner Group is uh, is a private military company. Um, of which, you know, it's not a purely Russian invention, right? If you think about Blackwater and, and some of the private military companies from the U.S. side that showed up in, in Iraq and other places around the world, uh, it's built sort of explicitly on that, uh, on that model, but of course works on a somewhat different basis simply because it's a, it's a very different political environment um, in, uh, uh, in Russia. It has been a way for um, the Kremlin to, to get involved in military or, or, or paramilitary operations around the world without having to um, run directly through the Ministry of Defense uh, and thus without having to get regular soldiers uh, killed and, and, and all of the, the, the possible consequences that might come with that. Also, it does play into this sort of game of, of, of plausible deniability. So we've seen them in Eastern Ukraine um, you know, since 2014 in bits and pieces, we've seen them in Syria, playing a very important role there. We've seen them in Libya. We've seen them in various other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they can be hired out as well by uh, by various governments that have insurgencies. So we saw, you know, just after the coup recently in Burkina Faso, uh, that, uh, that that there was conversation about would the new government hire Wagner to come and take take, take care of some of the insurgency issues that that the previous government there had been uh, struggling to. Uh, uh, struggling to, 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 to deal with, right? Um, but the implication then is it gives you a, a direct line back to the back to the Kremlin, and it gives the Kremlin a direct line into uh, into influence uh, in in countries where it does uh, where it does get involved. The last thing I'll say on that though is that what did start off as, as very much an arm's length relationship um, uh, is now much more tightly controlled. Uh, so they're not able to freelance as much as they used to be, um, and their operations are much more tightly coordinated through. Uh, uh, through the Ministry of Defense uh, and, and the general staff. And, and, and Prigozhin is this, um, often referred to as Putin's chef, where he's a catering um, uh, magnate, if you can imagine such a thing, also has operations in, uh, in uh, internet troll factories and that kind of thing. Um, he um, has 
um, uh, essentially started operating as, a, as an arm of, of, of the Russian military in recent months. Thank you. So we are just about out of time. I'll ask all three of you, we can start with you, Sam, and then go to Lucan and then Sergi. Um, do you have any brief final comments you'd like to make? Um, I don't in particular, except that we should be keep, we should we should keep watching uh, uh, watching this space. I, I will say one thing actually, which is that um, you know as as both Lucan and, and, and Sergi have, have pointed to, right? Expectations um, and kind of almost the emotions of, of war matter, right? And we get dragged along with them, right? So we thought one thing in the very, in the, in the very first days of the war in, in, in February. We thought another thing, you know, a few weeks later when when Russia began to retreat from around Kiev, and, and we thought another thing entirely, um, you know, after the success of, of Ukraine's counteroffensive uh, in in Kharkiv, and, and it feels like we're thinking other things again uh, again today. Um, I think that there is. There is a danger uh, as we watch this war of forgetting the longer durée stories that Luke and this are talking about um, and forgetting the bigger issues and interests that are at stake uh, and allowing our sense of what we should and shouldn't be doing, what kind of support we as the West should and shouldn't be providing to be caught up in our emotional response to the headlines uh, uh, of the day. Uh, I think that's, that's a mistake. It's going to make for bad policy and it's going to undermine Ukraine, uh, whether as a democracy or simply as a state. Uh, in in the long run. Um, so I would uh, thank uh, the Vail Symposium for the opportunity to take a look at the bigger picture today. Thanks. Lucan? Uh, yeah, I just want to we, return to the themes of the panel. I mean, I think um, certainly I think it's worth, you know, emphasizing that democracy is not guaranteed under, uh, you know, Zelensky after victory. But if on the other side, if Ukraine loses, it's, it's, it's certain that Ukraine, uh, you know, you know, at least the parts occupied by Russia will not be a democracy. So I think that really democracy is at stake in Ukraine with this war. And it's important to remember oftentimes sort of notions of um, compromise and people sort of throw around these ideas that somehow, you know, Zelensky should you know, provide an off ramp to Putin in exchange for peace or sort of offer territory in exchange that we're talking about real people um, in these territories who are suffering, you know, what I think many convincingly argue is it can, amounts to genocide and certainly mass violence um, in the in the Russian controlled territory. So when you if you, you're hearing people sort of talk about people like Elon Musk talking about the need to give up territory to kind of satisfy Putin's ego or whatever, know that that comes with massive massive human cost. Um, Thank you, Sergey. Yeah, so um, as, a, as a Ukrainian who lives in the American society and specifically who lives in Texas, um, I want to say that I've been increasingly concerned about the rise of indifference among Americans and more specifically even hostility that many Americans have towards Ukraine. And I think we've seen that rise uh, in response to, yes, uh, economic deterioration, the crisis that the many, many Americans are experiencing but also the rise of rhetoric uh, that is meant to discourage Americans from supporting Ukraine uh, in the media. Shows like Tucker Carlson, for example, where he consistently attacks Zelensky uh, and attacks Ukraine as a black hole where you just throw money and nothing happens. And you also hear that from some of the politicians, uh, especially on the right side of politics in the United States where there is this isolation strict that suddenly plays a greater role. And we see that in the polls that were conducted recently that shows that about 30% of Republicans think that uh, Americans has been supporting Ukraine too much, that there has to be a decrease in the support uh, for Ukraine at the time when this war actually takes a critical turn and when we need the support as much as any, any time before. So I, I would personally uh, urge all of our listeners today to first be very selective about, uh, on, about the information, where they consume this information and where, whom they listen to. Uh, and please do not listen to people who are, made, uh, who are intentionally inflaming your passions rather than providing you with objective information. That's point number one. And point number two, in line with what Lucan and Sam said, that is, Ukrainians are to, uh, to a large extent fighting not just for themselves, but also for democracy, for preserving democracy, and also for making sure that the United States does not have to go head to head with Russia. 
because if Ukraine loses, NATO will be next. And then the direct clash between Russia and the United States will be inevitable. So please support Ukraine in all ways you can and do not fall for all these political and other appeals to uh, think and uh, primarily about yourself and about the United States without forgetting about, uh, without and ignore uh, the outside world. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, Luke, and Sergey. Thanks for taking time out of your busy lives to spend some time with our community tonight. I want to thank all the people who viewed the program tonight. Please tell your friends. And we are working on finalizing a winter slot season of about uh, 18 to 20 programs. And we'll be rolling that out just as soon as we can. Thanks to everybody and have a great night.